Hello everyone, good day. Welcome to the online distance learning class for subject. Advanced Structural Steel Design, ECS 571. Let's continue with our second lecture, that is, Design Process for Composite Structure. At construction stage, designer must verify the cross-sectional resistance of the steel beam. Meanwhile, once the beam has been set compositely, design resistance of the cross-section at composite stage must be carried out against bending, vertical shear, shear connection and longitudinal shear. There are three design conditions that must be taken into consideration when designing a composite steel structure. The first is design at construction stage, followed by design of the steel structure during composite action at normal stage. And lastly is to design the composite steel structure at serviceability limit state. OK class, now let's we go through the design process for composite construction. As you can see here, in general, we will first need to calculate effective width, B, or be effective to determine the neutral axis x 3 calculate the moment resistance capacity mpl rd and shear resistance capacity vpl rd4 once the moment and shear have been verified next is to design of shear connectors 5 the effect of shear connector in triggering the local shear in concrete were then check 6 finally carry out the deflection check Okay, let me explain what does it mean by calculating the effective width. For your information, the composite beam acts like a T-beam in reinforced concrete structures. Due the effect of shear lag, the stresses in concrete slab above the ob will be higher than that away from the ob. The result is a non-linear distribution of stresses over the width of the slab. For ease of design, the stresses are assumed to have a linear distribution over a section width of the slab. This section is called the effective width, B or B effective. Figure shows the assumed linear and nonlinear stress distribution of the concrete slab. Because of that, the effective width is given by the minimum of EC4, clause 5.4.2 as shown here in which LE is the span for simply supported beam. The next step is to verify the bending moment and shear capacity of the composite beams. Firstly, we assumed that 1. Neutral axis lies in the concrete slab web does not buckle in shear second, carry out axial load equilibrium forces, by equating tension force equals compression force. Third, rearrange the equilibrium equation and you will get the neutral axis, x. To ensure the neutral axis lies in the slab, therefore, the depth of x must be lesser than height of flange, hf. As shown in the figure, for case, x less than hf, the MPLRD is given as shown in the red box. Meanwhile, the shear resistance is based on steel web alone, and the formula is the same as that of EC3 part 11. Clause 6.2.6. .6. However, if, if the neutral axis does not lie in the slab, other formulation must be used to determine the bending capacity. Once the bending and shear capacity have been calculated, the next step is to design the shear stud. Previously shown formulation is assumed that the concrete slab is fully composite with the universal beam. Shear stud is designed to create composite action and acting as mechanical means to transfer the interface shear between the slab and UB. If no shear stud being provided, then, the slip between concrete and UB will occur, as shown in the top figure. The use of shear stud will provide full composite action, hence prevent the slip between the steel and concrete slab. The strength of shear connector is dependent upon both the strength and elasticity of the concrete and the ultimate strength of the connector itself. EC4, clause 6.6.3.1 provide guideline on the design shear resistance of a headed stud. Automatically welded in accordance with R14555. 
the shear resistance of the headed stud should be determined as shown in the figure, while the value of alpha is defined as shown in the green box. Given here, our definition of the given parameters, in calculating the design shear resistance of the headed stud. The total shear force, NC developed between the points of maximum moment M max and M equals zero must be transferred for full composite action, which is given by NC. While, the total number of, of shear studs, NF required between, M max and M equals zero is therefore, given by NF. Figure shows the arrangement of the total number of shear studs, NF required, between max and M equals zero. OK class, once we have determined total number of shear stud requireds, therefore, we need to determine the spacing arrangement of the shear stud. As shown previously, the total number of studs in F can be uniformly distributed in the beam span between M max and M equals zero. However, the longitudinal spacing SL between the studs must satisfy EZ4, clause 6.6.5.74 and 6.6.5.53. Meanwhile, the transverse spacing between the studs must satisfy as shown in the red box. And the distance from the edge of flange to the edge of the studs must be more than 20 mm EZ4. Clause 6.6.5.6 Local shear in concrete is happened between the shear stud and the concrete. Therefore, we have to ensure the designed shear studs are capable in resisting the shear. As can be seen here, the design longitudinal shear force per unit run is given as highlighted in red box. To prevent local crushing of the concrete at the shear stud, there is limit to the maximum shear force per unit length on the concrete. Figure shows the local crushing of the concrete. In the diagram above, the concrete can shear at surface, OA, or BB. For shear in surface OA, steel area for shear, OE, or OSV equals a T plus a B millimeters 2 slash millimeters concrete shear area, a CV equals HF millimeters 2 slash millimeters for shear in surface BB. OE or OSV equals 2 OB millimeters 2 divided by millimeters OCV equals 2 HSC plus ST plus DH millimeters 2 slash millimeters for one stud, ST equals 0 where DH is the diameter of the head of the stud. However, for end span or exterior beam, OSV and ACV are defined differently as defined here. Here is to show the shear in surface BB. The shear resistance per unit length of shear plane along the beam is given in equation 1.5. If the calculation for VRD is affected by the use of metal decking, designer must refer to the manufacturer's catalogue and DC4 for further information. Once everything has been completely designed, finally, the deflection check is carried out. Deflections are calculated using unfactored loads. In UN propped construction, dead load deflection due to wet concrete and beam self weight are determined using properties of steel beam alone. 2. Deflection due to imposed dead load and imposed live loads are determined using properties of composite beam based on the principles of transformed section. In propped construction, all deflection calculations are carried out using properties of composite beam. This, however, We'll show in more details in example session. Figure shows how the original section being transformed. This can be done by calculate the modular ratio. Guideline to calculate modular ratio, N is given in EC4, clause 5.4.2.211. For simplification in structures for buildings, if appropriate allowance is made for the effects of creep and shrinkage of concrete, assume. The value for modular ration is shown in the red box. Meanwhile, the second moment of area of composite section I see may be determined from the box in number 6. As explained earlier, apart from composite beam, other composite construction systems are composite truss and composite plate girder. The approach to the design of composite truss, 
is similar to that of the composite universal beam. In this case, only the bottom flange is considered as acting tension and the top flange is ignored. The effective width calculations are similar to that for the composite universal beam. Axial and moment equilibrium for the section is then used to determine its bending capacity. Meanwhile, in composite plate girder, only the bottom flange is considered as acting in tension. The top flange and web is ignored. Effective width is determined in a similar manner to that of verb composite slab. Axial and moment equilibrium are used to determine the bending capacity. Effective width is determined in a similar manner to that of universal beam composite slab. Axial and moment equilibrium are used to determine the bending capacity, as shown in the figure. Equilibrium forces finally give neutral axis, X and moment capacity as shown in the red box.